Good morning, Wordsway. Is it still morning? It's still morning by a little bit. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Pastor Penny. Um, and I am before you guys talking about humility. <laughs> um, when Pastor Calvin uh, gave me this assignment, he's like, who better else to talk about humility? And I'm like, eh, uh, I guess. But the Lord had, um, the Lord had a way of showing me myself as I was preparing for this lesson. Um, and it was definitely a humbling experience, I will say. But by the show of hands, how many of you guys are married or soon to be married in the house? <laughs> okay, so I will be the first to say that marriage, at least mine, tests my humility on a daily basis. <laughs> and it is what the Lord has put before me this week in the prior weeks to show me myself and humble me, not only as a submissive wife, but humble me before him in an effort to get me to understand that, number one, you can't do it on your own. And number two, you need, like, you need, you need help in this, right? You need help in this. I designed you as a wife to be in unity with your husband, and you can't have unity if you just think you know it all, right? If you won't lay down yourself in an effort to join with the person that you're with, you, there's no unity. And he showed me this in a way of mirroring it also with the church. And so what I want to talk to you guys about today, um, I'm putting myself on blast. I don't want y'all to judge me because most of y'all are going to be like, what? She didn't do that, but I did. Um, so I've been trying to like remodel, so to speak, remodel my, my little home office. So KJ went away to school. So we got this open space and we normally use this room for, um, for like our studying and doing, you know, doing work, church work and all that. And so it really became like an accumulated room of furniture that we just had all over the house. And every time I go in this room, I'm like, it's so ugly in here. Like brown desk, white shelf, like it's just a whole bunch of colors. And I'm like, I want it to be pretty. Like this is what I'm doing every day. This is where I work. I want it to be pretty. So I started um, just, you know, working on it slowly. And I had this brilliant idea to make these desks. I don't know, most of you know me, who know me, know that I'm like a Pinterest freak. I really like DIY projects, do it myself, do it myself projects. And, um, and so I had this brilliant idea to like redo our, our office. And so I ran across these, um, this organizer at Michael's and it was 50% off with the coupon, but the coupon was only in the app. So I'm like, okay, well, I need two of these. And I know that my husband has an app too, right? So I'm gonna just have him come to the store with me and we're gonna, I'm gonna get these for a good deal. Two for the price of one. So he decides to come along with me and get these organizers, um, these little drawers, five drawer organizers that I want for my space. And as soon as we pick them up, he just starts like, these are gonna be so hard to put together. Ain't no way you're gonna be able to do this by yourself. It's so many pieces. And I'm just looking at him like, I got this. Like, chill, I got this. And so, but I don't say anything. I'm just letting him talk, you know, cause he's Mr. Fix It. He, he know how to put everything together and he got the plan, the man with the plan. So, um, you know, I'm just letting him talk, talk away. So we buy him and as we drive it home, he's like, yeah, we gonna, we gonna do this. We gonna get together and you can get next to me in all mine. I'm like, this was my project. Like, do it myself. I don't need your help. But I'm just trying to like, you know, yeah, that's cool. Okay. I don't, I don't say nothing though. But so this is like Sunday night, I believe. It's, it's pretty late. So we just call it a night. And Monday morning, spring break, I had a really long week the week before. So I just wanted to rest y'all. Like, I just wanted to rest. So Monday comes around and he's, he's got me up. We doing stuff, which is fine. So I'm like, okay, this is my chance. I'm about to take a nap. This man goes and pulls out the boxes that we just bought in Michael's. Come on, babe, let's, let's get this together. So part of me is I'm like, oh, 
already like, I don't need your help because I know you're going to try to take over. And number two, I just want to take a nap. Like, I want to take a nap. So he, he lays all his little pieces very neatly and meticulously on the floor. Part A's are here. The B's are here. The screws are here. And he looks at me like, come on, get your box. Look, lay it out like mine. I, I got this. Like, follow me, and you won't mess up. You won't be here all day. And I don't know, but I got so irritated. Like, this was my project. I want to do it myself, and I don't want to do it your way. I want to do it my way. So <laughs> I pull out my box anyway, and I sit down on the floor and start opening it. And I don't even remember what he said, but I'm like, you know what? I've had enough. Put my little box back up, and I went to lay down and take a nap. <laughs> the loving husband that he is, he still finished his drawer, even though I did not ask for his help. He still decided to take upon himself to do that. So I, I did appreciate that. But still, in my mind, I wanted to do it myself with my music playing, looking at the instructions piece by piece, trying to figure it out along the way, right? So I go in here, and I'm taking a nap. I'm probably asleep for about 30, 45 minutes. And um, he pushes Karis in on top of the drawer. And he's like, and she's like, we're done. Great. I'm still taking a nap. So um, after this, he's like, I'm going to go get some lunch, and I'll be back. We can watch a movie, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> it's funny because as soon as he walk, walked out the door, all of a sudden, I wasn't sleepy no more, y'all. <laughs> but my mind, in my mind, it was so bad because I'm like, I'm about to show him that it's not going to take me all day to do this by myself. And again, I don't need your help. I literally got out of the bed went in the craft room and started to put this thing together. And in my mind, I'm like, I got to be done before he get back. Because if I'm not done, he's going to laugh at me and I'm going to feel stupid. <laughs> so I go and I, I'm looking at the instructions. I'm piecing it together. Karis is bothering me. I'm like, babe, leave me alone. I'm trying to get this done before he get back. So I'm, I'm putting it all together. And of course, I put one of the pieces on wrong. So I had to unscrew it. Looking at the instructions, trying to figure out how to put it together. And as I'm doing this, have y'all ever just felt the Holy Spirit just shaking his head at y'all? <laughs> I'm like, I just dropped my head like, this is pathetic. <laughs> this is really pathetic. So, of course, you know, I still got it done before he got back. But that was not the point. The point was, why do we do that, y'all? And what God told me is that this is the same way my people do me. You pray for this, you pray for favor and you make out this plan for yourself, and then we get mad when God tried to step in and direct us for the easiest route that we could take to get it done like that. But we want to do it our way. We want to do it when we want to do it. We want to listen to the jams while we drive and while we got the wheel on the road. And God is like, I've already, I've already got this. All you got to do is follow my lead. And that's essentially what he wanted me to do, just follow his lead. We can be done with this in 30 minutes, and then we can eat and chill. But guess what? I didn't want it that way. So what I've learned, what I've been learning through this week, is that sometimes all we have to do is take a step back and realize that we don't have it all. God did not design us to have it all. He designed us to submit ourselves to him because he has it all. And in an effort to... In our own efforts, we always going to fumble, y'all. We always will put on a piece wrong and have to unscrew it. And we'll always just fall short because we are not the standard. We didn't write the instructions. And so through this, this lesson in humility, I want to give us an opportunity, number one, to, to understand that the do-it-yourself method is a method of the world. It is a method the culture tells us that we can be self-sufficient self -sufficient in everything that we do. We did a series, um, Selfie Trap, uh, Words, Word Wednesday, a few years ago, and it was just um, really mind-blowing how the culture tells us that by doing it ourselves, we can achieve a certain amount of greatness in our lives. By... Um, getting degrees, and not, none of this is bad in itself, but when we look to these things to identify who we are, 
that's when they become the problem. When we look to our achievements and our accomplishments and our efforts of being holy, that is when it becomes a problem. And that is when the Holy Spirit literally starts to shake his head at us because that's not the way that he designed it. So I want us to, um, I guess I will introduce my title today. My title for today is Garment Change. And we are going to be on the topic of humility, right? Okay, um, so God wants to draw us closer to him. He wants to lead us and guide us. And we, when we decide that we want to do it myself and take this, this mentality, we separate ourselves from the living power of the Holy Spirit that is on the inside of us. As I was um, writing this lesson, I was thinking about all the things that I actually missed out on by sitting down side by side and allowing um, my husband to guide me through this process of putting this thing together. Number one, I just missed out on quality time, right? So a lot of times we decide that we want to put our mind and our efforts and our will into trying to figure out our life instead of surrendering it to God, meaning that we will get closer to him. We'll get that intimacy time with him because we're coming before him on our knees, praying to him, asking him, Lord, which way do you want me to go? Lord, which tool do you want me to use? Lord, what person do you want me to talk to today? Who do you want me to give to today? Like, this is how we are able to draw closer to God when we put down our, our own selves and we are totally dependent on God. When we are totally dependent on God, my will doesn't matter. The way that I, I want to do things, it doesn't matter. It's how do you want to do things? How do you want me to do these things? And when we're totally dependent on him, it's like waking up to a fresh new day. Where's like my, my food? Okay, God, you got it. I need gas in the car. Okay, God, you got it. The house is all, okay, God, you got it. Like this is how our demeanor, our mentality should be. God, you got it. I'm not worried about any of these things because I know that you will provide, that you are my source, and that I can depend solely on you in everything that I do. My degrees won't get me there. My, my, my credentials won't get me there. The time that I've spent on this job and my experience won't get me there. It will be by your provision and your word that says go. And that's what we have to understand with this do it ourselves mentality. So I thought it was pretty funny that um, Moses, um, who wrote the book of Exodus, was it, in the book of Exodus, it says that Moses was the meekest or the humblest man on, in all the earth. And I thought like, dang, how do you write that about yourself and still be humble? Like, it was kind of confusing. But I know that all scripture is god breathed so of course the Holy Spirit led him to do that. But the Bible tells us that Moses was the meekest or the most humblest man ever. And the way that he led, it was completely dependent on God and his abilities, and, or, and not his own abilities, I'm sorry. Um, and I was thinking that Moses led in this way, but the Israelites did not follow in this way. And um, of course, when we have leadership, God placed them before us to be an example of what he is expecting from us. We are, as leaders, we are high, held to a higher standard, and in that effort, we are diligently going before the Lord, asking him, and humbling ourselves before the Lord, so in turn, we can be servants in all of these things. The people see this, and that is how they respond, back in a servant mannerhood. Um, but the Israelites, that's not what they was on. So they did not follow his lead, and they thought that they knew what was best for them through their entire process of the wilderness. Not only did, just the wilderness, but even throughout just the whole life. They just kept messing up, and they kept putting these things in their own fleshly desires and their own selfish ambition before the word of God. And no matter how many times the Lord provided for them, they still wanted to do things their own way. Yeah. He gave them manna, and they wanted meat. Like, 
he gave them um, he he gave them so many things that and they still he freed them and they wanted to go back to Egypt because because why 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 I don't even understand but these are the he continued to provide provision for them and Moses tried very hard to get them to understand that listen when we get to where God is taking us to when we get to the land of abundance of milk and honey and in places that we didn't even have to build and all these things these things are before us I need you to not forget about God don't look for one minute think that you did this by your own might don't look around you and say, oh, look what I did. But how many of us are guilty of that? How many of us get to a job and make it to a supervisor or manager or CEO level and look around and think, oh, dang, look what I did. Look what all these people are doing because of me. And this is a prideful mentality that, honestly, the Lord hates. When we are pride full of ourselves and full of pride we can't be full of the holy spirit so he's not leading us he's not guiding us he is not directing our lives as we are called to as christians so um deuteronomy chapter 8 is the warning that um, moses gave to the people um starting at verse 11 it says excuse me but that is the time to be careful once we get into the promised land that is Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. This is a warning. Be careful. Warning comes before destruction. Be careful careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in Egypt. And I thought that it was so sad that we have to be reminded of this. The Lord who freed me from my mess, from my distorted mind, who freed me from my shame and my guilt and everything else that I can think of, my twisted mentality of of how the world worked and how the world should revolve around me and how I deserve this and I deserve that and all of these things that I thought about myself, the Lord pulled me out of that and showed me a new walk of life. He showed me that I could trust him with my life. He showed me that I didn't have to walk around in the shame and the guilt and pity of the mistakes that I had made. He, he gave me love. He gave me peace. He gave me joy. And I did not do anything to deserve that. It was by his grace. The house that I live in, the car that I drive, the people that are surrounding me every day that love me and, and uh, like all of this stuff. And how dare I wake up one morning and think that I got here because of me. Like there's nothing inside of me that powered me to be here today. There's nothing inside of me today that changed the way that I thought. Because if it were up to me, I would not be here, y'all. I would not be here. And it's not to say that, um, that I don't want to be here. It is an honor and a privilege to serve Word's Way. It is an honor and a privilege to serve my Lord on a daily basis. Because my life is better because of it. But how dare I ever step foot to say that I'm here because of me. And I feel like when we take that approach to life, I don't feel like it, I know. The Lord will humble you. He will humble us. And he will make you understand that it is not you. It was me. And a lot of times what we do is we put on this crown on our head and we walk around like we're, maj that, that we're majestic, that we're the king and the queens of our families and of our worlds and, and that everybody should do what we say or everybody should walk on eggshells around us because I'm mad today or because um, I, I didn't get this the way that I wanted it or I'll go to McDonald's and you messed up my food. Like we have this mentality that everybody should be serving us. And sometimes it's not this conscious, this conscious thing that we wake up in the morning and say, hmm, I wonder who's going to serve me today. No, most of the time it's not. Some of us, we are that powerful, but 
But for the most part, we don't wake up just looking for people to serve us. But it's the way that we maneuver in our everyday life. It's the, the, our lack of servitude that, that gets people, that gives us that mentality of having people serve us. So we walk around with these crowns on, trying to find this, the biggest seat to sit in, right? And understanding we need to get to a posture. Humbleness is a heart posture. It is a matter of the heart to not walk in the room and expect the best for yourself. Humbleness is walking into a room and asking, who can I serve today? Not taking the biggest seat in the house, but helping somebody else to that seat. And more so than, than helping somebody else to the biggest seat in the house, how about we just put a reserve sign on it and say, Lord, this is yours. I'm not touching that because I know that I, I don't deserve to be sitting there. Like, how, why do we approach life in this manner that we deserve so much? And, and it saddens me that Moses had to honestly warn people to not be so full of themselves. And I think what the problem for most of us is that we're afraid to admit our weakness. We are afraid to solely depend on God because for so many years, people have let us down. For so many relationships, for so many jobs, for so many um, friendships, the people that we've sur been surrounded with, we've allowed ourselves to be vulnerable to them. We've allowed, um, not maybe not allowed, but people have hurt us in our vulnerability. They've taken our kindness, they've, they've taken um, a pure heart for weakness, and they've completely taken advantage of that. And for that, I'm completely sorry for that. But in that, it's still not an excuse to not lay that weakness before God. A lot of times we try to um, take our relationship with people and compare them to God. But he is on a higher level. He promises and gives us promises that I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. The Lord, everything that the Lord does is for our own good, and he is not going to hurt you. So you can lay your weakness before him. He wants our weakness so that we can be made strong in him. But in an, in an effort um, to just be more and do more, we, we miss out on that intimacy with God. We miss out on a grace-filled life. We miss out on so much because we just can't be weak. We can't surrender our weakness to the king. In, um, in Luke, there is a, um, a parable of two men. Luke 18, um, verse 10, it says that two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. Despised because he was a Jewish man that took taxes from other Jewish people. Um, and they just didn't like that. They thought he was a traitor. Nobody liked the tax collector. Um, so that's why he was despised. Um, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I am certainly, certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. How, how many of us go to great lengths to disguise our weakness? How many of us would rather pretend to be strong in front of the people than to admit that 
I don't know it all. Then to admit that I need help. Then to admit that I need prayer. I'm struggling today. Like, these are the things that we present before our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. These are the things that we present before God in an effort to be holy. In an effort to say that I am better than you because I'm just good. Because I prayed twice a week and I fast last week. So, you know, I'm, I'm good with God. Um, all these things that we do, I serve on this committee and that committee and that committee, and I'm here Monday, I'm here Thursday, I'm here Friday, so what? So what? How, how can we put this before God and say that I am all of this, so you should, in turn, favor me for this, because I'm better. But this other guy came before the Lord, he couldn't even look at him. And I'm not going to lie, this is me sometimes, y'all. Like, I know that I, that I am filled with, with the Holy Spirit, and I know that the Lord has saved me, but sometimes we have to get to a point of understanding where we simply came from, understanding and remembering what the Lord has saved us from. Like, when I, if I literally sat here and just meditated on that for long enough, I would probably start crying because I do not deserve to be here. But the Lord saw fit for that to, like, for me to be here. He saw fit to clean me up and wipe away all those stains and all that dirt and all that gunk from my mind and my heart. And he saw fit to place me here. Like, he saw fit for that, for me to be a, a daughter for me to be adopted into his kingdom. Like, he saw fit for that. And I, and I just want us to get to a point of understanding that our weakness is not a bad thing. There's, there's a question when you do an interview. I think, I, I know I dread it. That question, what is your greatest, your greatest weakness? Why would I tell you that? Like, why are you even asking me this question? Like, what am, what am I supposed to say to that? I think I hate that question the most because, like, and most of us pretty it up like, oh, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I, I like everything so perfect. So sometimes that can be a bit much for people or I'm an over communicator. Yeah, whatever. Like, we, we come up with these pretty things to put down, like, for this weird question. But in all essence, the Lord is asking for your greatest weakness. He's asking you to lay it down before him and allow his power and his strength to make you strong. Like, I am not a great communicator. Like, I, I stuttered for like the first probably for ten, five, ten years of my life. Like, all of these things, excuse me, sir. No, <laughs> I like, no, but seriously, like, I never imagined myself to be talking in front of a crowd, like, I don't know how many times I have to say it, but I am not here on my own power. Like, and this is the weakness that we have to present before God so that he can give us the strength to, to make disciples. We don't, we're, I'm afraid of people. <laughs> like, I don't know how to go up to somebody like this man. Do you know Jesus? Like, I, I can't do that. But God gives me the strength to be bold. Like, he gives me the power to know that I don't have to fear any man. I don't have to wonder or worry about what people think about me because I, like, Christ lives in me. And it is his power that makes me be able to do what I am able to do to minister to people, to share my story, to tell people that God has freed me and you can be free too. Like, these are the things that we have to continue to, to give to God so that his work in his kingdom can be done. Because the more that we continue to focus on ourselves, the less that we are doing for his kingdom. And the Lord is simply asking us, like, are you tired yet? I, I honestly remember, like, this question, like, are you tired yet? Like, why do you have to fight so hard to be strong? Why do you, and I, I know why I fight hard to be strong, but it's all of those things that I mentioned earlier. Like, who hurt you? Who took advantage of your weakness? Like, who made you feel inferior because of your weakness? 
and whoever that was, erase it. Like, erase it, because it doesn't matter. God is standing in that place with open arms, saying, son or daughter, like, it's okay. I can take that for you. I want to take that for you. And I, we have to, like, really think about these things. I was doing this um, Bible study called Unraveled Roots, and I've just been, like, really trying to get to the bottom of my issues, y'all, because I got a lot of issues. I got a lot of issues. But the thing about it is I can present those to God, and he can help me forgive people. He can help me realize that others' people's problems and how they made me feel, it wasn't because of me. Like, he can help me to understand when we really start to dig and, and not be afraid of that stuff, but to really give it to him and say, God, I'm having these thoughts, I'm having these feelings, I'm feeling this type of way, like, help me to understand this and, and show me how I can really move past this stuff. Because that's the only way that we can really surrender to him like, is, is once we've, we, we start to unpack this stuff. If we don't understand why we have to have this bold front in front of people, like, well, we won't be able to break that bondage. Like, we have to really start asking these questions in prayer. And it's not trying to figure it out by yourself or buying some self-help book. Like, no, we need to go to the Lord with this stuff because he's the only person who can heal and transform our minds. We really have to put this stuff before God. Um, Paul, this is like, this is my, my favorite scripture um, in, in the Bible, and it's 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 10. Um, and in this, Paul is just talking about his weakness and how the Lord has made him strong. And it says, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from being proud, or full of myself, um, I was given a thorn in my flesh. This is a reminder that I need to depend on God. Um, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Yes, the Lord will allow Satan in your, in your realm. Like, he, he will. He is a prince of this earth, and the Lord has allowed that. It doesn't mean that he won't protect you, but it does mean that you're going to get tested. What are you going to do about it? Like, you're going to get tested. So it says, um, to torment me from being proud. Three different times, three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away from me. Paul knew where his help was coming from. Many of us pray one time and be done with it. Like, no, we have to continually, continually go to the Lord about our issues, about our, our pride, about our self-control, like all of these things. Doesn't mean he's going to take it away, but hey, keep going anyway, right? Um, so each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. God's power works best when we admit our weakness and submit that we are nothing apart from Christ. Um, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses. Excuse me. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses um, so that the power of Christ can work through me. This means that I've decided to give you the will and allow you to drive this vehicle. And where you take me, I know that you'll provide. If you take me on this high cliff, I know you're going to catch me if I fall. If you're taking me to the valley, I know that you will be my refuge, that you will be my comforter, that you will be my provision through this storm and through this, this wilderness. And we have to have this mindset. Um, it says, so the power of Christ can work through me. That means that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was being led by the Holy Spirit. So that's why I take pleasure in my weakness and the insults and the hardships, the persecution and troubles that I suffer in Christ. When I am weak, for when I am weak, for when I am weak, then I am made strong. What is the point of calling yourself a Christian if you won't allow your prideful self submitting that pride to him and recognizing that we have that God has all authority over our life. 
What is a point in calling ourselves a Christian if we won't submit to that authority and allow him to truly work in and through us? It's, it, it honestly, it's like calling ourselves something but not really believing it. Like, not really identifying with the power that is even behind that thing. It's saying that I work for a company but not really showing up to work. Like, it, it just doesn't work that way. Why, why would I say that I am a son or daughter of Christ if I don't accept his authority in my life? Like, why? Um, we have to learn how to put down our crown and move from that seat. Move from the seat that should be reserved solely and only for Christ in our life so that we can be of some use to the kingdom, even if it's just a little bit. Like, continue to lay down parts of yourself so that you can be used for the kingdom. And when we are not able to lay down our life and we're not able to put down that crown, understand that it does lead us away from the Lord. It leads us from God, blinding us to everything that he's doing in our life, right? So going back to that do it myself mentality, because when we're not being led by him, we're thinking like that we're doing it all by ourselves. But by no mistake, don't by no mistake ever think that just because we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us, that it's not God's grace covering you every single day of your life. Because I don't know about you, but I didn't make myself breathe this morning when I woke up. Like, I don't have the power to do that. So even if we're still walking around pridefully, God's grace is on us every day. And that alone is enough to just thank him for. So I, I, I just want us to understand these things, like seeing God, being completely dependent on God, instead of being independent, become God dependent. And it brings us to a deeper level of humility, of joy, and just simply gratitude. Um, we are called to deny ourselves, not the power that is at work within us. And um, my point two is called deny, deny, deny. And I thought this was, I thought I was being like a little clever, but y'all see why. <laughs> I thought I was being a little clever, but um, so self-reliance is an illusion. Think about that for a second. Self-reliance is an illusion. Thinking that, thinking that something is there when it's really not. The enemy has lied to us. The enemy has duped us to make us believe that we are something more than what we are. And it's not to say that we're just like nothing worthless little pieces of, of crap. But what it means is that our confidence is not in us. Our confidence is in God. And I've, I've said this, I'm hoping that y'all like getting it because I've said it so many times, but it is a lie. Self-reliance is a lie designed to destruct the legitimate authority of God. And when we start to believe that we are in control, we lose sight of how powerful our God really is. So we all have heard about Peter, right? Peter is funny in a way that he had this self-confidence about himself. Like he, he thought that he thought that he was like up here. He thought like, God, I'm a rock. Jesus, I'm riding for you. Nothing can come in between us. Like I'll go to jail for you. I'll die for you. All this stuff that he told Christ, and the Lord looked at him and was like, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. But he just swore up and down, like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Everybody else in this room might deny you. They might leave you, but I will be right here, Lord. Like, this is his proclamation. And, and in, Luke, um, in Luke 22, as Jesus was telling him this, Jesus himself said, I, the devil is coming to sift you out. But I am praying. Jesus told Peter that he was praying for him. And that kind of blew me away because 
It just did. But Peter didn't grasp that. All he, Peter did not grasp that Jesus is praying for me. If you know Jesus is, if I knew Jesus was praying for me, I'm on my knees right next to him. <laughs> like, okay, what's coming? I don't know what's coming, but I'm actually, I'm behind him because I know he, he's going to be the one to protect me. Like, but not Peter. Not Peter. Nope, Lord, I got this. Ain't nothing going to stop me. I'm going to ride for you. Like, all of these things that he just puffing up his chest, and Jesus was just shaking his head. And it's crazy because, like, Peter's lack of humility made him be off guard. It made him unaware to what was coming so that he didn't have a chance to prepare because he was so full of his own confidence in himself that he never once fell to, the, the, fell to his knees and prayed to God for help, for direction, for guidance. Like, Jesus was telling him this all along, like, I am going to leave you. Like, I am... I'm going to die. Like all of these things. But Peter, Peter never took that as needing to learn all that he could, needing to be reliant on Jesus, focusing in on what he was doing so that he could replicate it when, when Jesus was gone. But it created this fake sense of security. And he it neglected, he neglected prayer in the moment that he needed it the most. Because he thought that he had, he thought that he had it, right? And so many of us do this, but I want us to understand that the quickest way for the Lord to humble us is to have self-confidence. If you, you want to test the Lord and be humble, boast about yourself and have self-confidence because he will humble us quickly. Romans 12 and 3 says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Do not think that you are better than you are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Many of us come into church so full of ourselves, y'all. We are so full of ourselves and our own ability that we lose sight of everything that God is trying to do through us. I think that even through all of this, Peter was humbled really quickly when I think the words came out of his mouth that, and he denied the Lord three times. Like imagine standing before Christ and telling him that this will never be me. I will never do that to you, Lord. And then moments later, I don't know that man, like denying the Lord three times, how quickly Peter was humbled, understanding that he really knew nothing and that he should have heeded to the warning that Jesus gave him. And I I find it really interesting that through Peter's journey, we don't have time to really go through it today, but the Lord came to Peter and asked him, and after denying him, after going to the cross, Peter, or Jesus came to Peter and asked him, do you love me? Three times. And in this instance, I think that we have to like, really think about that and understand like the heart-wrenching the heart-wrenching thoughts that Peter were were thinking and going through during this time but what I love about it is that God redeemed Peter um, in a way that made Peter realize that I am a servant of you I am nothing apart from you so even though he had to go through all these things to understand that there are Peter, Paul, James, Jude, and probably a few more apostles in the Bible that that start their books out as being slaves of Christ. So you go from thinking that you have it all to being a slave for Christ. And of course, a lot of us have this really, you know, screwed depiction of slavery because of history and, and past. But being a slave to Christ is what I proclaim to be. Being devoted to surrendering myself to Christ. Asking the Lord what it is that you want me to be. And of course, I don't do it perfectly, but I'd, I'd rather be identified as a slave to Christ than a slave to anything else in this world. But I thought it was really interesting because a lot of times when we're, you know, we start, if you write your own book, a lot of, you know, on the back of the book, it's got this little 
biography about who they are and how many degrees they have and where they came from and what school they went to and how many other books they wrote. Like, most, like I would think that that's how the apostles would want to start, you know, like this whole thing, but they didn't. They didn't talk about their resumes. They didn't talk about, you know, that they were siblings of Jesus. Like, they did not bring this up at all. All they said was that I am a slave to Christ. And this is how we are to do, deny ourselves on a daily basis. It's not our resumes that make us anything. It's not where we work or how m much we come to church that make us anything. It is how much we are serving. It's how much we are suffering that we need to begin to identify with. And this is how we humble ourselves before the Lord. In, in this manner, we can become unified as a body of Christ. And the kingdom work gets done. When we're able to put down ourselves and pick up, hey, I'm changing my clothes, and I'm a slave today, y'all. Like, I'm serving you. I'm serving you. I'm serving you. And I'm okay with that. I don't have to feel bad because I'm standing at the door opening the door for people. I don't have to feel bad because I'm putting on gloves and I'm cleaning the toilets on Saturdays. Like, I don't have to feel bad that I'm, I'm with the kids every week. Like, that does not upset me at all. I don't have to have a position of power. I don't have to have these things because I know where my identity lies. I know that I am a son, that or I am a daughter, that you guys are sons and daughters of Christ, and that that is where my identity lies. And I don't have to have a, a position. We should not have to have a position in the church in order to serve, in order to be used as a kingdom vessel. Like, we, so many times we come into the church and, and, and think that, because we gave, because we attend Sunday services, because we are serving, like that we des deserve something greater than, than somebody who may not give, than somebody who, who doesn't serve, than somebody that may not know the scripture like you do. Like we have to come off this mentality that we are better than people because of our abilities. I am no greater than you. You are no greater. Like, it's come out of that mind frame. If we are to be united in Christ, like, if we are to be a body of believers that is really out here trying to save souls, we cannot think like that. Like, we cannot think like that. Because what it does, it creates disunity. It creates separation. It creates jealousy. It creates animosity. It creates envy. And this is not what makes up a, bo a body of believers who are really trying to go hard for Christ. It's just not. It's somebody who's trying to go hard for themselves, right? So even, even outside of the church, of course we serve each other, but what are you doing outside that represents Christ in that manner, right? So um, Philippians 2 and 3, Philippians 2 and 3, it gives us an example of Christ. He was... God that came to be man. He put on the role of a slave, of a servant for me and for you. So what makes us think that we are better than Christ? If we are supposed to replicate him, why are we trying to take his seat in our lives? We're supposed to be examples of him, like walking alongside of him. But that's not our mentality. And in order for us to really be a church that is kingdom-minded, that pastor is trying to get us to understand, like, we cannot think in this manner. So Philippians 2 and 3 says, do not be selfish. Do not try to impress others. Be humble, thinking about others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Though he had it all, it did not matter to him. Though he could call down a legion of angels and get off the cross if he wanted to, he still surrendered and died on the cross for me and you. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Then, or when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself 
in obedience to God. He surrendered his life to God. He was human form, just like you and I, and he could have done whatever he wanted to, but he surrendered that to God in an effort to go to the cross and, and carry out the prophecy. He died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory of, Father, of God the Father. Jesus Christ knew who he was. So he did not have to shy away from, serv from serving people. Like, he didn't have to. A lot of times, we don't want people to think of us as lowly. We don't want people to think of us as, like, the little serving girl. or the ser Like, we don't want people to. Th we look down oftentimes on waiters and servers as if they're beneath us. Like, but we don't want people to think about that, about us in that mentality. But Christ was so... He was ready, like he wanted us to see him as lowly. He wanted us to see him as a servant so that we could replicate him. But for some reason, our pride will not allow us to do that. Our pride will not allow us to take off our crown and fall to our knees in submission to him and his word and his commands for our lives and for like to love people and to serve people, and to be for people. Like, our minds won't allow us to do that. But I really want, I really want you to think about those things. I'm all, I feel like I'm always trying to make y'all think. But I really want y'all to like reflect on the things in your life that make you afraid to be weak. Reflect on those instances or those people that made you feel like being weak wasn't okay, that being weak wasn't manly. Like, think about those things and really bring them to Christ in an effort to submit them to him because he wants to take that from you. He needs you to surrender that to him so that he can live and work through you. The Holy Spirit is a gift to all of us, but we have to allow him to be active and working in our life. And he's not going, he's not going to fight with our pride. He's going to wait until we lay it aside before he does anything in and through us. So I, I need us to understand that a lot of times we come to church and, and think that, that we are discipling people, that we are helping people, people be better in Christ. But we're not helping people until we're showing people and, and getting them to understand that being a Christian is about suffering. Being a Christian is about serving. Being a Christian is about replicating Christ. And yes, we can come to church, and yes, we give, and yes, we do all these wonderful events. Did y'all have fun last week? Y'all had fun last week? Um, but we can do all that stuff, but it doesn't matter. Like, it does not matter in the grand scheme of what God is trying to get us to be, to mature us to. In our humility, he wants to do so many wonderful things through us. He wants to save people. Like, he wants to do that through us, through his, his Holy Spirit. Like, he wants to do that. I want us to get out of the mind frame that serving and suffering is beneath us because it's not. We should be proud to serve. We should be proud to suffer for, for Christ. And we just have to come to that realization that it's okay to be weak, y'all. It's okay to say, Lord, I don't know it all, but I'm giving it to you. And I want us to just, like I said, reflect on those things that make it really hard for you to show that weakness, that make it really hard for you to reach out to your brother and sister and ask for prayer that make it really hard for you to give up your time, to give up your talent, to give up your treasure, and be a servant in the house of the Lord. Like, what are those things that are holding you back from doing that?